And thanks actually for um, referring to Memento because I hadn't really thought of um, talking about that. Um, but so Memento is uh, time travel for the web. It's an extension of the HTTP protocol. And it basically allows you to view a URI um, the way it was a while back, basically. You just think of uh, setting a time in a calendar user interface, and then your browser will basically travel the web as it used to be, uh, leveraging web archives, old versions of uh, wiki pages, uh, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> it is relevant uh, to mention that because you'll see that my whole perspective, the perspective that I'll be conveying here, is very much web-focused. Um, uh, I think, of course, I agree with Natasha that uh, everything is digital, but I also think everything is networked. And I think it's an extremely important bit to take into account when we talk about archiving. The presentation that I'm going to do is very similar to the one I did at uh, Don's workshop in January, uh, which was the result of two weeks of brainstorming with Andrew Trelor, who couldn't be here today, uh, who's from the Australia uh, National uh, Data Service. And so we were um, put together uh, by Dance to think a bit about the uh, archive of the future. And basically this presentation, I mean, it's not literally the same, but still, this is uh, what came out of there. I need to emphasize there's really a reason that it's called a perspective, because that's just our way of thinking about it. There's no truth here. It's not like there's any proven facts or so. This is really just uh, thinking uh, in progress. To put in the uh, terms of Ricky's presentation, I think this bit focuses most on the collect and fix uh, aspect. So I'm actually rather obsessed in how are we actually going to obtain the materials to get archived in the first place. I know that there's all kinds of challenges involved in then keeping them usable and all, and that's your digital preservation aspect. I'm much more obsessed with, so how are we getting them into archives in the first place? <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm going to start with giving you my kind of um, pers perspective on how scholarship uh, is changing. And I'm going to do that uh, on the basis of a framework provided by two Dutchmen, appropriately, uh, Rosendal and Geurts. Then I'm going to give you a whole bunch of examples, uh, indicators of how the future is actually already here. And then I'm going to use these examples to provide a characterization of the future in several uh, kind of dimensions. And then what should be four, and is listed, of course, in Windows as one, thank you, Microsoft, <laughs> is uh, ideas about uh, archiving the future. So Rosendahl and Geurts uh, wrote a paper in 97, and there's been others that have been thinking along the same lines. And basically, they identify what the essential functions of scholarly communication are. So basically, they're saying, irrespective of their implementation, these things, these four things, any kind of system of scholarly communication uh, must fulfill. So first of all, the registration. Uh, that allows claims of precedence uh, of a scholarly finding. So that's basically uh, a researcher or an author shouting, this is my idea, okay? And then the certification, and that establishes the validity of the claim. That's basically the scientific community saying, yeah, dude, you're right, you found that, and it's actually, we agree. Uh, awareness. Uh, allows actors in the system to remain aware of new finds. So there's a discovery mechanism, you know, you, you, you remain aware of new claims that are put into the system. And then archive, uh, archiving, which is uh, the topic um, of, of this meet, or at least of this presentation. So preserving uh, the scholarly record over time. Uh, important in all of this is that there's no scholarly record without archiving. And I think that's why we're here, okay? So very briefly, <clears throat> to make that a bit more concrete, when you look at the journal system in its paper-based form, okay, all these functions were really vertically integrated in the journal. 
So the registration was, uh, you know, done by manuscript submission. So you submit the manuscript to a publisher. Certification is the peer review process. Awareness, that's basically you walk through the shelves and you find a journal that you're interested in. And then, of course, libraries had some alerting kind of mechanisms in place. And archiving, well, that's the libraries that kept the journals uh, on their stacks. Okay. And then you fast forward to the current digital version of the system for scholarly communication, and you see that the first two bits haven't changed. Okay, registration is still submission of a manuscript, <coughs> certification is still peer review, again, under control of the publishers. Awareness, that's now all these kind of portals that we have, run by publishers, run by search engines, what have you. And then archiving, you know, basically uh, special purpose archives, have emerged like portico locks, clocks, uh, and some publishers are doing digital preservation. <clears throat> Already here, you see one of the major characteristics of the digital network environment, namely the fact that this disaggregates these functions. So while in the paper-based system, all of these things were vertically integrated you know, in the journal, here you see already uh, disaggregation where indeed registration certification, that's still the publisher, but now awareness can really be pulled out of there and archiving can also uh, be pulled out, okay? So, and that is something that is typical of the digital environment. I've written a paper about that uh, 10 or so years ago where it basically talks about how we can have a completely decoupled system of scholarly communication where each of these things are done by different parties, by other kind of portals uh, on the web. So that's, you know, that was the past or where we live now. <clears throat> and I'm going to give you some examples of how each of these functions are fundamentally uh, changing. Uh, this was a code that Andrew came up with. Uh, it's actually by William Gibson and basically said the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. And indeed, all the examples that I'm going to give you about the changing uh, scholarly environment, they're all things that are out there uh, already. So the future is here. So I'm going to go through these four functions of scholarly communication, starting with uh, registration, uh, certification, and uh, onwards. So again, as soon as uh, the digital arose, uh, we started to communicate by digital preprints, uh, meaning things that were not certified, but just communication of findings without them actually uh, being certified. That was first in physics, but this is now happening in a lot of other domains also. And here's the example of uh, BioKIF, which is a, a preprint archive uh, for the biosciences. This kind of stuff is not even restricted to real scientists anymore. There's an awful lot of um, activity in citizen science. You probably all have heard of Zoo Universe, where people you know, can contribute, uh, for example, identify stellar objects and uh, what have you. But here, actually, this is new. I think this was only announced uh, last week or the week before. We now have the Zoo Universe letters. And this is where citizen science can now publish papers. Okay, so suddenly, you know, there's a scholarly record that doesn't really even belong to scientists anymore. Now the public is also doing this. And of course, they called it letters after the Republic of Letters, which is uh, kind of uh, rather interesting uh, as an observation as such. <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about data because everyone talks about data. It is just interesting to consider how rapidly data has become an integral part of the discussion of the scholarly record. I mean, five or ten years ago, hardly anyone would talk about it, and now it's just uh, all over. But it's not only data, it's also so uh, software, as uh, Natasha talked about. And you see uh, massively, actually, scientists that are starting to use common platforms such as GitHub to develop software that they're going to use in their scientific experiments. Interesting observation about a system like GitHub as very good versioning <coughs> mechanisms and as social interaction features. So this is not just a one-off kind of thing. Here your software evolves over time. Everything is timestamped. Every version gets an own identifier uh, and so on. <clears throat> 
I don't write software anymore, but I consider my presentations part of my academic record. And so I stuff everything onto SlideShare because, you know, uh, it's easy for uh, sharing information there. So the scholarly record doesn't stop at written stuff or doesn't stop at software. There's also uh, these kind of things that can be included. <clears throat> Along the lines of GitHub, uh, there's an increased use of common web platforms for scholarly purposes. And what we see here is wiki pathways. It's basically a regular wiki environment that is used to share biological uh, pathways. Okay, and again, this is because it's a wiki, a system with time stamping and versioning and social interaction. Same thing different. This is a lexicon actually, so vocabulary that is being created collaboratively by science, uh, scientists here in the neurosciences. So terms are being defined here, and these terms are then used in papers that you know, refer to the vocabulary, and obviously vocabulary changes over time. And again, you have the notion of time stamping, uh, a particular definition of a term at a certain moment, and then you know, the evolution uh, of that over, uh, over time. <clears throat> and then maybe most exemplary, of what is going on there. And this, I think, relates to a large extent to some of the things Natasha was talking about. It's this notion that uh, an, an artifact, a scientific asset, doesn't stand by itself anymore. Uh, there's the interconnection, interdependency uh, of things. And that got formalized in a thing called uh, research objects. Uh, comes out of the University of uh, Manchester and is actually based on work I did in uh, uh, 2008 with uh, OAI Object Reuse and Exchange. These are bundles of all kinds of artifacts that pertain to a search, certain uh, research endeavor. And so there could be a publication in there, but not necessarily. Uh, there could be data, there could be workflow, uh, software that you know uh, works on the data. There could be slides uh, in there. Uh, there could be uh, all kind of metadata describing the thing. Important is that this formalization has actually been done in RDF, the Resource Description Framework, which is uh, a machine actionable way to glue all these things together. So each of these things have identifiers on the web. They have all HTTP URIs and they are all bundled together in a machine actionable description in RDF. And there are links in between these things that talk about what the exact relationships are between all these components of uh, that bundle. Keep this one in mind because this I really use as a metaphor of the kind of things that we have uh, to deal with in the future. So not only is it all digital, not only is it compound, but it's also interlinked and it's all over the network. These things do not necessarily at all live on one platform. These things are distributed all over the place. Okay. <clears throat> so observations, summary let's say for registration, wide variety of objects, dynamic, the versioning, right? Uh, compound, interrelated, all over the web. The notion of registering things without certifying them, okay? When we register the paper, it immediately also got certified and it only saw the light of day as a joint registered and certified thing. That was the journal paper. Here we see registration of an awful lot of things without anyone really saying, yeah, yeah, you're right, this is good. This is just uh, being registered. Time stamping versioning. Over to the second function of scholarly communication, which is certification. So one of the things we see increasingly is commentary, post-publication commentary, as an additional form of certification. So these are papers in uh, PRJ that have already gone through a regular uh, peer review process. But then on top of that, we get commentary of authors that somehow provide a next level uh, of peer review. Open Journal just announced actually a couple of days ago, but totally along the lines of the vision that I wrote down 10 years ago in that paper I mentioned earlier. This basically is a platform that will do peer review, certification, 
of material preprints that are deposited in the physics archive. So you have the physics archive and unpeer-reviewed materials go in there. And then on another platform, which is the open journal, we will overlay uh, certifications on top of them. Why is this important from the perspective of archiving? Well, because now there's not one thing that you need to archive. Now there's two interrelated things that you need to archive, and they live in different places on the web. One lives in the physics archive, one is going to live in the open journal. And there's going to be a connection uh, between those two. I'm coming back to SlideShare. Uh, earlier on, I mentioned it for registration. Indeed, I put my stuff in there. But there's this weird kind of certification here in that it shows how many people have watched your presentations, how many have liked them, how many have commented on them. And, you know, where that is not a formal way of certifying materials, it is an indicator of validity. Some of my Memento presentations in there have over 10,000 uh, views. So there probably is something to them, otherwise people wouldn't waste their time uh, on them. And the last example of certification, a uh, really interesting one. This is about machines uh, doing a level of certification. This comes from um, a citizen science project called FeederWatch at Cornell University. And here uh, it's people in the field that are doing observations uh, of birds, obviously, right? It's called FeederWatch. Uh, and that information is then transferred into uh, a database almost immediately after observation. And the database has algorithms that protect it in the sense of there's delimitations of uh, possible validity, potential validity of, of observations, so that one in Northern America wouldn't say, well, I observed a bird that only lives in the south of Spain, so to speak, okay? So here it is really machines that are doing some validation of uh, the observations. Summary of this. Again, this notion of certification that stands by itself is not integrated with uh, registration anymore. <clears throat> Various types of objects get a wide range of types of certifications. So it's not only rigorous formal peer review, it's all kind of indicators you know, that something uh, is valid or not. Social interactions uh, play quite a role in that. And I've just shown you the notion of machines being involved in the validation process. Awareness is a simple one. How do we find out about uh, you know, new findings? Well, we do Twitter, right? I mean, it's just amazing. Uh, most of the information that I work with now, I get via Twitter. Uh, so all the links, all the stuff that I read, almost all of it is by following the appropriate people uh, on Twitter. So Twitter is used an awful lot for dissemination of scholarly information. I don't know whether you heard of my experiment. This fits in the research object kind of realm. So in here, th this is a portal uh, where basically people can upload these kind of groupings uh, of objects. Uh, typically, you know, core element is workflow software. But in addition to that, there can be some uh, data, uh, some PowerPoint slides, and so on and so on. Again, very uh, similar to the things that uh, Natasha was talking about. This is a portal with social interaction, but also with the search engine. So that's a way to discover uh, workflows that you can then start to uh, reuse. Narcis uh, in the Netherlands, obviously uh, very well known. Uh, a search engine also, so discovery of scientific material, uh, but that actually uh, is an aggregation of everything related to the Netherlands. So this is not only about papers, it's also about data, about researchers, about institutions, about research projects, and so on. And I think something similar is going on uh, in Australia, if I'm uh, not mistaken. So this notion of grouping everything in a regional context and providing one uh, discovery mechanism for it. This is an awfully interesting one. Uh, so we heard about uh, lab notebooks. Well, there's also the notion of uh, lab notebooks that are actually online rather than just sit in the professor's uh, environment or desktop. So this example here comes from the Open Malaria Project. So this is uh, obviously, as you can see, uh, a web page. And what happens here is as researchers are setting up an experiment, this information becomes available online. And then way more than that, 
as they start a new experiment or get new findings, you can actually be alerted, you know, about, hey, we're starting something new, we have a new finding. So this is literally with an alerting mechanism. You don't even have to go to their site. You're going to know when they actually discovered something new or, or are up to something new. So the observations here, awareness, you know, so discovery for a wide variety of objects, sometimes with dedicated search engines, uh, sometimes with, you know, aggregated uh, types of engines. Real-time awareness, literally in the moment, you know, we become aware of work that others are doing. And again, social media, uh, social interactions are playing an incredibly important role in that. A couple of examples of what is going on regarding to uh, archiving. So clocks is an interesting example. Uh, consortium, really. Uh, I'm sure all librarians here in the room are familiar with this. Consortium of publishers and uh, libraries, institutions worldwide, uh, that look after uh, preserving uh, the journal uh, publication record. Dance, obviously. I have to uh, uh, mention Dance because I'm their guest. Uh, <coughs> but here, uh, one of the reasons I mention it is that Dance is obviously a data archive, but they specialize in certain kinds of data, uh, social sciences, uh, humanities, where, and now this is the mandatory slide for Andrew, because he works in Australia. Uh, this is the Australian Antarctic Data Center, and this is, again, specialized kind of, it's data, but it's specialized kind of data. It's about Antarctic uh, observations. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether you're familiar with that, librarians in the room. You should be, as a matter of fact. Uh, this is the perma -CC, uh, effort coming out of Harvard University. But really what's behind this is an international consortium of law libraries that are extremely concerned about uh, link rot in legal publications. So just like you have 404s on the web at large, uh, when legal documents are referencing websites, you're going to have link rot there also. And so here they have uh, established this uh, special purpose web archive, uh, in essence where an author of a legal document can go in, enter the URI of something that he or she is going to cite in the legal document and get that page then uh, archived. And then basically uh, in the citation, you're going to refer to the original URI as well as to uh, the archived URI, okay? This is along the lines of what I think is extremely important for uh, libraries uh, to get involved in. <clears throat> With these digital archival repositories comes the whole notion of, well, can we even trust them? And how are we going to figure out whether uh, we trust them? And Dons has done some uh, pioneering work in this realm with the data seal of approval. Low barrier kind of thing, but still uh, indicator of trustworthiness uh, uh, that is extremely important. Climbing up the ladder, there's a DIN certification and ISO uh, certification. But the point is that once we have these archives, and we'll have tons of them out there, not just one, but they'll be distributed all over the place, it's going to be extremely important to be able to trust them, know whether you can trust them, audit them. And Sometimes when you think audit, maybe you think, okay, there's a couple of guys that are going to come in and they're going to look at your server. That's part of it. For me, audit is also the ability to say, well, there was this thing on the web with this identifier. Do you actually have it? You know, that, that I find an extremely basic, but still very important uh, capability for audit. All right, so archiving of various types, distributed consortium. Right? You can't do it by yourself, so you better play with your friends and uh, audit for trustworthiness. Okay, all these examples were really to arrive at some kind of characterization of the environment that we're uh, moving uh, towards. So, brief summary of this. Oh, so this environment that we're you know, moving towards, I've started, and Andrew and I have started to call the web of objects. Uh, I think Natasha calls it something like the ecology, you know, but I think we're, we're to quite an extent uh, talking about similar things. Registration, wide variety of objects, I think I've shown you that. 
The notion of versioning becoming increasingly important, the reason being that none of these things out there are fixed, or hardly any, that they you know, completely are uh, in flux, interrelated and independent. So assets do not stand by themselves anymore. They are interdependent on others. Uh, they are uh, in relationship with, uh, with others. Certification, a wide variety of mechanisms that are used there, formal, non-formal, machines, social, and then the notion of decoupling certification from uh, registration, which I think is very important from the perspective of archiving also, as I mentioned before, because now we have multiple systems involved in just you know, one kind of asset. The system where you register it, and the system where the certifying information uh, for it is. <clears throat> Real-time awareness, awareness via social media, uh, uh, yeah, we got all of that. So I'm going to show you two of these kind of things which came out of the brainstorms with Andrew Trelor. And the first is characterization of the scholarly communication as such. And the second will be about the objects you know, in uh, the scholarly communication environment. And so you see these kind of lines from left to right. So we come from the left, you know, the left is kind of the past, and we move towards uh, the right. One of the core observations is about the research process itself. The research process that used to be largely hidden from public visibility and that is now becoming totally visible on the web we are seeing research being conducted on the web. I have showed you the open malaria example, that just one. So it is not only the outcome of research that is out there on the web, or the final outcome, it is the process itself uh, that getting to the web. If you don't believe me, read up on it. There's all kind of very high-end equipment, scientific equipment out there that is getting web APIs. So you don't even go to the lab anymore, you call you know, you basically steer the instrumentation via web APIs, okay? So not only are we all on the web and our results are all on the web, our instruments actually also are on the web. Registration from discrete, you know, like every now and then I'm going to submit the manuscript somewhere to continuous. My software that I have in GitHub is continuously alive, and hence there's new registration every couple of minutes, basically, and each of those have a version. Certification, I think I mentioned from formal uh, to informal. It's not like the formal goes away, it's just that there's an awful lot of informal uh, that is being added. Awareness, one of the biggest uh, changes, I think, right, from this delayed kind of notion of, well, uh, I will know about this researcher's finding in two years, right? Because first the paper has, well, first the research has to be done, then the paper has to be written, then it has to be reviewed, and now it gets published, you know, for certain disciplines that takes easily three years, right? To much more instant uh, awareness of what is going on. And archiving from medium driven, like there were organizations that were good at keeping books and at 3D objects and so on, and now, really content-driven because everything is digital, right? So, but what you see is specialization of archives, certain digital things, you know, like Dons does the humanities, and the Antarctic uh, Data Center does data for Antarctic studies, right? It's not like they pile them all up in, uh, in one environment. The objects, <clears throat> I think I'm hammered this in, so fixity goes from fixed to varying, so things are in flux. From atomic, like a journal article, to compound, these research objects, okay? Things don't stand by themselves anymore. They are interdependent and related to other things. A wide variety uh, of uh, materials that we are going to have to deal with. From standalone, and this is a very important one for me, and I think this may be something uh, that I differ in opinion uh, with Natasha, from standalone kind of notion of objects to connected objects, networked uh, objects. And then, you know, to add a positive note, uh, hopefully from closed access to uh, open access. <laughs> because open makes it all so much easier, even when it comes to archiving. All right, 
all of this really a kind of introduction almost to what I'm going to talk about now, which is a perspective of archiving uh, in the future. So I want to repeat the core observations, uh, the core observations uh, that I made. Was that 10 or 20? <laughs> 10. Oh, that, that's bad. OK. So the research process, not just the outcome, is becoming visible on the web. Massive extension of the scholarly record with an enormous variety of new kind of objects. Objects are heterogeneous, dynamic, compound, interrelated, all over the web. And the objects are often hosted on common web platforms, in many cases that are not even dedicated to scholarship. GitHub, one of the good examples. Uh, you know, I also mentioned SlideShare, but there's plenty uh, out there. Okay? So scholarship is conducted on platforms that are used for all kind of other uh, reasons also. The reason I mention all of this is really to try and convey that I at least am convinced that these are characteristics that you need to take into account in your archival paradigm. That you cannot keep you know, pretending that everything is like it was. These are so, such fundamental characteristics that when you think about archiving for the future, you need to take that into account. Four things, I have four things, so that means I have two and a half minutes. I'm, I'm going to speak five minutes longer, I think. <laughs> um, are we on the right track? Then I'll contrast archiving paradigms, recording versus archive, and then that nice little picture that I think you have in your handout I'll talk a bit about. First, are we on the right track? Well, my answer is going to be no, obviously. I wouldn't be here otherwise. I'm going to give you two examples of why I think we're not on the right track. Just look at the web-based uh, journal system, <clears throat> okay? We are doing a very poor job, as a matter of fact, in archiving that. Don't take my word for it. Uh, uh, David Rosenthal, who's a very respected person, he's Mr. Locks, right? Uh, he's done, uh, you know, done quite some uh, research in this realm. And basically, his findings are that, at most, 50% of the journals, the digital journals, are archived. And that the ones that we have archived are too few, too healthy, and too easy. By which he means they're the ones from the really big publishers that are not at any risk of disappearing anyhow, that are easy to grab, you know, because someone stuffs them in onto your computer, but the ones that are hidden out there on the web, we're actually doing a really bad job at. We actually don't even know what is archived. There's attempts now with the Keepers Registry out of uh, Adina, okay? But that's incomplete. And in addition to that, here's the interesting bit. The Keepers Registry is completely, the thinking behind it is in the old world of ISSN, volume, issue, that kind of stuff, not URIs or DOIs. So this is why I said I would like to be able to audit that thing. And how would I audit whether a certain article you know, is in a digital archive? Well, I'm not going to use ISSM volume, etc. No, I'm going to do, use the DOI, right? Well, this facility does not, or not yet, have that. Not doing a good job there. It gets worse, and this is related to research that I'm currently doing in the Hyperlink project with the University of Edinburgh. Not only are publications linking to other publications, they're also linking to all kind of stuff related to research. And now I'm talking you know, web at large resources, okay? There um, may be project websites, there can be software, there can be presentations, you know, these kind of things. And oh, increasingly, and actually dramatically, there's an increase in links to those kind of things uh, out there in publications. We find in the hyperlink research that a large majority of these things are not archived. So where would those be archived? Well, in web archives, like the Internet Archive and such. That's where those things would be. The large majority of the things that we reference that are not publisher stuff, but that are just web at large things, we do not have an archiver record of, okay? 
And so this is actually something that we can audit with the memento infrastructure that Andrea brought up earlier. One actually can take URI and figure out which archives, web archives around the world uh, have them. But so why am I emphasizing all of that? It's because we've, we've moved our stuff, our traditional stuff onto the web and everything you know, has started to crumble down when it comes to archiving. We don't even archive our digital journals well, and when our articles reference web material, we are not archiving them. I'm mentioning this because this, I think, is what is coming up. This is an example of the challenges that we're going to face, only they're like way more severe uh, than this. So if we're not doing a good, good job at this, you know, chances are we're not going to do a good job at the bigger picture either. Archiving paradigms. This is a slide that wasn't in the first presentation. So I've tried to kind of, for myself really, and so I'm very happy to take criticism, uh, provided the perspective on the archival paradigm as I think I see it today, and then I'll contrast it with how I would want to see the one for the future. So to put a publication in Portico, data in Drive, or even you know, a bundle of these things in my experiment, the paradigm that sits behind this is there's an atomic object. There's, there's something, you know, one, one thing. It's finalized also. I'm going to put it somewhere when it's done. When I put it somewhere, I remove it of all the context. You know, the, the stuff that surrounds it, I'm just forgetting about. Maybe because these things are atomic and self-contained enough, I can do that. We think of these things, and this goes back to Natasha's presentation, as files in file systems, okay? And then we have that file and we upload it somewhere, but they're files in file systems. The archival request is made by the owner of the object, and the time is decided by the owner uh, of the object. And let me contrast that with these new kind of things that I see that are you know, interrelated uh, kind of resources. First of all, compound. So you can't strip away the context because the context is essential. So you'll need at least to archive you know, a few things you know, that belong together. The constituents in this compound object are in continuous flux. So they're not in a static kind of state. It's all about which state of this <coughs> complex system am I, I actually going to snapshot. The perspective on these constituents for me, changes fundamentally when I think about this problem. They're no longer, for me, files in file systems. They're resources on the web with URIs. Okay? So I look at this as a web archival kind of challenge rather than let's preserve our disk systems. And here's a really important one. So if this is the kind of objects that we are dealing with, all these little resources, they sit in different areas of the web and they're owned by different people. And so the point is that someone is working with these things for scientific purposes and decides this is the status, this is the version that for me is very important. And now it's no longer the owner of these things that is going to decide who's going to archive. It's actually the researcher who knows this is the important version of all of that snapshot now. So you almost have to think of it of on-demand kind of archiving. So the owner himself deciding, well, you know, I'm going to you know, snapshot a version every week, every month, or whatever. It's kind of not good enough because you may not actually archive the right version because you don't know what your researcher actually is working with. Okay. I don't know whether I, I convey that. Otherwise, we, we can talk about it uh, later also. Okay, I think I said all that. Recording versus archiving, so uh, that was alluded to earlier. This is again this notion of the increased use of web platforms for scholarship, so things like GitHub, Wikis, WordPress, that all have like extremely attractive features. Very good versioning mechanisms and timestamping, the whole notion of social embedding, so you know you can nicely uh, engage with them. However, and this was actually one of the bigger insights of Andrew and I during our two-week discussion about that, 
These are not archival platforms. These are recording, uh, recording platforms. They're very handy, but they're not archives. If you don't believe it, just look at uh, the terms of service of GitHub. I'll just read the first one for you. GitHub reserves the right at any time and from time to time to modify or discontinue temporarily or permanently you know, shut down the service with or without notice. That's not an archive, right? I mean, <laughs> as far as I can tell, this is not how an archive would profile itself. And so just you know, to bring the notion home of there's a thing called archiving, it's where we do our work, uh, sorry, a recording, which is where we do our work, but archiving is a different matter. And in this little thing, we try to kind of contrast the two, the notion of short term for recording and long term for archiving, no guarantees regarding longe uh, longevity for recording, attempts to provide uh, guarantees in archiving, recording is write many, read many, archiving write once, read many, and then the clear distinction, recording helps the scholarly process, which is on the web, whereas archiving is about the scholarly record. And then the last bit is this little figure that you have uh, in your handout, which was somehow how um, Andrew and I try to characterize. Again, this is a perspective. This is not truth. This is just how we thought uh, about uh, the environment, kind of the infrastructure uh, of uh, research for the future. Uh, where, so you see our little researcher at the right hand side that is doing uh, her stuff and then the research community at the left hand side. And so initially it could be that your researcher works in a private infrastructure which we regarded to be ephemeral. That's really your desktop environment, everything that you have locally. But then at a certain point the researcher decides to transfer certain of those materials that are in the local environment to the web-based uh, recording infrastructure. And there can be several incentives to do that. Uh, to share with self on another platform, to share with your colleagues to start collaborating. Maybe because of a mandate of your institution or your funder that says, hey, I need this stuff to sit in a manageable basic infrastructure, otherwise I cannot guarantee data management for you in the long term. I clearly cannot guarantee it when the stuff sits on your USB drive or your hard disk. Okay. And then the notion that there's also the archiving infrastructure, and then somehow materials need to transition from the recording infrastructure to the archiving infrastructure. And there's all kind of, now know of course that this is not just one system that we're talking about. For each of those layers, you know, there's hundreds and hundreds kind of systems uh, out there, okay? Recording could be GitHub and SlideShare and all these wikis and all, this. so there's thousands of those systems out there archiving the same, distributed archives all over the place. And so the notion of then at one point, curatorial decisions have to be made to transfer materials from the recording infrastructure in the, into the archival infrastructure. Okay. The good news is that once things are in the recording infrastructure, you work with the global namespace, and so basically the materials are available for web scale processes aimed at archiving. Okay. This is very different than stuff sitting in your desktop. Once things have a global name and are globally reachable, you can set up web scale processes uh, to uh, collect them. Important about that transition is the ability to take snapshots at certain <coughs> points of materials and their related uh, materials, how to transfer them from recording uh, into archive, and then again this curatorial decision, what actually uh, should be archived. Whichever way you look at this, you see the need for different kind of interfaces be between the recording and the archiving infrastructure. Organizational, so for example, uh, if GitHub is indeed so important that stuff needs to be archived, should we not set up a collaboration, you know, a conversation with GitHub to say, hey, how can we make this happen at scale? 
there are already things ongoing uh, with that realm, but maybe you know, those are one-off shots like from GitHub to Figshare or from uh, GitHub to Zenodo. But this has to be generalized, okay? You cannot do this one, it's just uh, unscalable, okay? So organizational interfaces, technical interfaces, meaning interoperability, you know? How does it work? We have thousands of systems in the recording infrastructure and thousands of systems in the archival infrastructure. Again, one-off solutions are not going to do it. We need interoperability to make that happen. And curatorial, again, interfaces, the decision-making there in the middle. Same thing actually applies for the archival infrastructure. Also there, these archives will somehow organizationally and technically have to work with each other so that they can guarantee a long-term uh, digital record of uh, scholarly communication. That was it. Did I have five minutes extra there? <clears throat> Thank you so much. Thanks. You talk about recording infrastructure and archiving infrastructure. The thing which is often discussed is the curation. Uh, so is it on purpose that you don't have this sort of in-between where you do the curation, where you do not necessarily go for the persistency which you have in an archive? I mean, for instance, I think the DOI saying something about 10 years or 15 years or 20 years would be curating and not persistency because that's for hundreds of years. So do you have some comment on that? I'm not sure I understand the question. I don't even know what DOIs are doing uh, here. Uh, no, no, so, sorry, you could, I mean, you could call I mean, well, the thing is that you have the recording infrastructure, which is something which is sort of when you create this. Yeah. You have the archive infrastructure, which is long-term infinity yeah. in principle. Yeah. Now, what a lot of people talk about in research uh, infrastructure is a curation, yes. which I, is something which is not recording and which is not archiving, yes. but well, is an infrastructure be in between. Yes. And, and that's what is written here, curation, decision, you know, the, that whole thing. And I have no, these are only questions really, because I, I, I have no answer to the question of how we, we were actually going to do that. And it was actually one of the questions for discussion groups I think I put forward. You know, what are the criteria involved in the move from here to here, the curation decision really? Uh, and I could see there's aspects of how important is this object in the sense of uh, social perception? You know, I couldn't have a notion of, well, actually, the researcher is going to decide at which point certain of these objects need to be you know, moved from there to there. Others could be, well, we just don't have money. I'm sorry. You know, so we're not going to archive that. And hence, maybe we're just going to archive a snapshot in the sense of metadata, you know, a trace rather than uh, the entire thing. These are the things that I think need to be discussed, okay? What, what the curational interface and decision-making process is there. But it is in there. <laughs> but I think the point Birte wanted to make is that there might be even another, another layer. So depending on what, what time horizon you put behind archiving, sometimes it's obviously called curation, and yep. then it's like short-term archiving, if you think in terms of infinity. Yeah, and I think so that's, an interesting, that's an yeah. interesting remark. While in that slide, it is the translation process from the recording yep. to the archiving. Yep. Okay, Thank sorry, you. I didn't understand the question, but now I get it, yes. There was another and question over there. There was first another question over there, then in the back, and that comes back to the So my question changed after you answered, uh, Bertha. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> At the beginning, you talked about uh, how interested you were in the challenge of collecting and fixing. So one of the things is you talked about the archiving. You, you mentioned consortia and trustworthiness. You, one of the things that I'm uh, going to ask you to do is, is to think about, um, about the levels uh, at which these different uh, decisions and tasks ought to be done. Because you know, one of the things that I think has also shifted is, is where we think institutional scale is the right scale at which to do some of these tasks. And you know, if you use your sort of topology, you know, that's another place where you could talk about shifts. Which things have shifted from individual to institutional, from institutional to consortia or to some other scale? And maybe just looking at that graph, and, and saying a few things about scale uh, would, would help us think about it. Well, 
Scale is, I think, one of the things I do have in mind very much when I think about this. And this is also why I come from a web perspective and web scale processes. That's why I hammer it in that I look at all of this from coming from the web, not coming from desktops, uh, for example. Um, I had like double the amount of slides uh, that I showed, which I all uh, got rid of. But part of what was in there was about the notion of orchestration <coughs> of this entire uh, transition phase. The thing to understand, I, I think at one point I said there's this, these specialized kind of archives, right? Uh, depending on ton content type, because it's all digital, so you're going to have to stuff the material in the appropriate archive. Now, appropriate can be content-wise, can also be regional, right? Because the Germans want their stuff in Germany and the, the Americans may be in America, you know, uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, maybe institutional, <clears throat> right? And so I could imagine that someone in this infrastructure, uh, so I come from the perspective of uh, requesting for archiving. So let's say I'm a researcher and I'm at a certain state of my work where I think all these interdependent objects, they're now actually rather relevant. This is a very relevant state. I most likely am going to write a paper about this. So this is the moment that I want to uh, archive it. So what I see happening here is I issue an archival request <clears throat> for these interdependent kind of things. And such an archival request may go into an orchestration service that for each of these interdependent things decides what the best, object, uh, what the best uh, archive is. Mm -hmm. Is it a discipline archive? Is it your institutional? You know, what exactly am I going to archive? Well, the entire object or maybe just a, a snapshot thereof. So the notion of, it's very different than what we do now. Uh, I have <coughs> a data file here and I'm uploading it into Drive. This is, again, this file system kind of metaphor. Here, we're working in a web environment. All my resources are on the web, and he hence I'm going to use a web process to launch the archival process. And so, I, again, I could imagine an orchestration service sitting there that decides on the nature of all the interrelated things that I'm dealing with, what is going to happen. <clears throat> An important aspect in this. So think about this, right? So I'm a researcher, um, and I use a certain database that sits at the other end of the world. And it's a massive database. And there's obviously no way that I'm going to archive that database, right? Uh, because it's just too big. And, and I wouldn't even be allowed to, because it's not my property. <clears throat> so hence, this notion of asking someone to archive becomes so important again, right? Because I'm basically going to issue a request to the database and say, this state of your database, that's what I worked with, this is extremely important, okay? Can you, they may not actually archive it, but can you at least record the core characteristics of the state of your database so that I can later on refer to it? This is very similar, and Mika and I were at, um, um, a workshop about um, <clears throat> archiving, um, sorry, uh, challenge, computational challenges in uh, data citation. And one of the ideas that floated around there also from Peter Buneman from Edinburgh uh, University, so this was about citing data sets, right, and states of data sets and so on. And his very basic but I think correct observation was, well, you should ask the owner of the database, how that slice needs to be cited. And I very much agree, and it's a very similar thing as requesting to archive, although that may not, we, sometimes we think of archiving of creating a redundant copy, not necessarily. Could just be, these were the dimensions, this was the time, blah, 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 right? And this is how you cite it. So it's a very similar thing, <clears throat> okay? So as I am going to cite that thing, I'm going to need from the database owner some kind of citation back that unambiguously describes what the state of that database is. Well, as I've asked for it, they've already taken the snapshot, right? 
the kind of snapshot. Again, not a copy of the entire thing, but some kind of description of the state of that database. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, <clears throat> there was one more question there. Quick question, quick answer. <laughs> and Come on, I'm on the roll. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a bit of a call. Yeah, no, it's not, not really a problem. You're just thinking. And if you can wait with your questions yeah. for after, then we would uh, try not to steal too much from your lunch time. So go on with your All right, uh, David Prosser from Research Libraries UK, and I'm quickly trying to think of a quick question. Um, so, Herbert, in the first half of your talk, uh, excellent talk, you talked about the way in which um, we, the way in which we fulfil um, the functions of scholarly communication are changing. And, and at one point, you said, "Of course, this is all in addition to the formal mechanisms that we traditionally use." Yep. And I guess the speculation is that at some point, does that need for the formal, the five, six-page scientific article? disappear because the environment has changed so much, so much is in the open, so much is transparent, do we still need that formal version of record anymore, or, or can you see that disappearing? That's a very tough one, right? I mean, there's so short many... <laughs> <laughs> okay, the short answer is the publishers will make sure that we'll still need it. 